Well, hi everyone and welcome back to the second half of the 2020-2021 Geotechnical Graduate Student Seminars. I hope that everyone had a nice relaxing holiday break and are ready to tackle another semester. I'd first like to point out just a couple of pertinent items. So the Geotechnical Society of Edmonton will be hosting a two-part webinar series on 3D slope stability analysis using the SV slope software package. These sessions will be hosted on January 26th and February 2nd. If, uh, if these interest you, you can head over to the GSC website and sign up. Uh, the UACGS also released their January newsletter this week. It includes an interview with our very own Dr. Beyer and some insight into opportunities in the dam industry. And finally, the uh, APEGA Student Liaison Committee is hosted an engineering and geosciences industry mixture on January 21st. This is a great opportunity for students to network with industry representatives and to begin forming relationships that may help with future job opportunities. A link to the sign up is provided on the UACGS newsletter, or you can contact me for more info. Without further ado, let's get to the presentation. So today we have Dr. Nicholas Utting, who works as a research scientist with Natural Resources Canada at the CanMet Energy Lab in Devon, Alberta. He will be speaking to us about two case studies. The first compares an oil spill of dilute, diluted bitumen with conventional crude. And the second will touch on subsurface gas migrations associated with wells at CO2 injection sites. Dr. Utting's research focuses on the potential impacts of oil and gas development to groundwater resources with a specific focus on groundwater chemistry. Dr. Utting completed his undergraduate degree in geology at the University of Calgary and subsequently completed his PhD at the University of Ottawa, where he researched groundwater in permafrost. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nicholas Utting. Well, thanks for the intro. Um, yeah, so the title of my presentation is Potential Impacts of Oil and Gas Development on Groundwater Resources. Um, so I guess we kind of have questions at the end because um, I don't know if I can see anyways the chat anyways um, yeah so as Kevin mentioned I'm a research scientist at CanMet Energy in Devon um, so this presentation um, is going to focus on kind of two aspects of my work uh, but I'll kind of go over a bit more some of the other stuff uh, I work on as well um, so we'll start out with a bit of background on oil and gas and groundwater. Um, and then uh, two different case studies. Um, so one on comparing spills of diluted bitumen with conventional crude and the other um, noble gases and subsurface gas migration. Now I am not sure I'm, then that should not block what you see. Uh, and when I was, uh, I was thinking about this yesterday of kind of what, you know, what's the, what's the objective of this talk? Um, and uh, well, I was, I was walking my kids home from daycare and they were really uh, dragging their heels. <laughs> so I had some time to think about this. Um, so I guess if you're a, uh, you know, if, if you're not a hydrogeologist uh, or if that's not really in your interest, uh, you know, hopefully you're gonna just kind of see some interesting, well, what I think is really interesting work um, in hydrogeology, hydrogeochemistry. Um, and if you do work in kind of more rel water related side of geotechnical engineering, um, you know, maybe some uh, just interesting research, uh, maybe some methods that might be applicable to you. So I guess that's kind of what I'm, I'm hoping you might get out of my presentation. So uh, kind of in terms of background on oil and gas, um, Canada has the third largest crude reserves in the world. Uh, it's fifth largest producer of oil and gas. Um, now these numbers are a little out of date, uh, but three and a half million barrels of crude a day. Um, and that's, I think a 2013 number. So it would be higher now um, at 13.7 cubic feet of gas per day. Uh, and a lot of that, the oil, a uh, big, chunk of that oil is coming from oil sands production um, and that oil is produced as bitumen. So uh, that's very viscous. Um, so it's extracted differently than either oil and gas reserves. So there's in situ production and they basically inject steam, makes the oil, the bitumen less viscous and then it can be pumped out or uh, as, as being Albertans 
kind of all aware of the mining in the oil and oil sands. And, and for that mining, you know, it's, they dig it up and then they put it through this hot water process with some additional chemicals and that separates out the oil, the bitumen from the, uh, from the sand and then other fines and then it has to be re refined. Um, so what's kind of the impact on water resources? There's also the potential for spills and leaks. Um, and this is kind of on the chemistry side of things that if you have a spill or a leak um, that you can impact water quality. Uh, there's also kind of water quantity impacts of extraction of water um, either for the oil sands process um, or injection kind of reservoir floods in kind of conventional oil and gas. Um, so this kind of slide here is just to really kind of show, try to link together kind of a bunch of these things that I work on. Um, including the stuff that I'm not talking about today, but you know, we have a uh, kind of pipelines. Uh, if you have a spill from a pipeline it has a potential to impact groundwater or surface water, but uh, focusing on the groundwater side of things. Uh, then um, either at injection, where you're injecting CO2 into the subsurface uh, for kind of basically sequestering CO2 or also with hydraulic fracturing. And uh, well, all oil and gas wells, there's potential for, for this gas migration along boreholes. Uh, but then also I do some research related to uh, orphan and abandoned wells, um, kind of a focus on sumps at uh, old well sites, uh, a master's student working on that. Uh, and then some other research related to seepage from oil sands tailings. And then uh, also some other work related to uh, hydraulic fracturing. But we're going to focus today on the pipeline, kind of potential for a spill from the pipeline. Uh, and then uh, gas migration. Now, in terms of groundwater, um, about 30% of Canadians rely on groundwater for their water supply. So that's about 23% in Alberta. These numbers are a little old. Actually, they're quite old. They're from 96. Uh, but I don't think things have really changed that much. Uh, you know, in Edmonton and in Calgary, we're getting, we're, our drinking water's from surface water. Uh, but in, you know, in rural areas, uh, people are heavily dependent on groundwater. So if groundwater is impacted, uh, there's a potential for people's water supplies to be impacted. So the first case study, uh, this is comparing spills of diluted bitumen with conventional crude. So why, why are we doing this research? Uh, so kind of the uh, kind of big reason is there's been concerns um, from the public relating to environmental impacts of a spill of diluted bitumen. Um, and that's kind of all spills, but especially diluted bitumen. So what really is diluted, bit, diluted bitumen? So when they extract that oil sands, that bitumen from the oil sands, it's too viscous for pipeline transport. So a light hydrocarbon is added to it to make it less viscous to be able to be transported by a pipeline. Uh, but it remains, diluted bitumen remains more viscous than conventional crude, sorry, jumped ahead accidentally. Um, and it's denser than conventional crude. Um, it has a higher boiling point. Um, now the one thing that I, I didn't really realize until I, I worked with this material and the really actually kind of the first experiment we did with this was what that viscosity meant. I had this picture in my mind of diluted bitumen. Um, well, uh, I was thinking of it, oh, it's like, like molasses. Well, bitumen is really like molasses. When it's diluted bitumen, it's still more viscous than conventional crude. Uh, but to be able to flow in a pipeline, it is much less viscous and it does, it does flow. Um, so that's just something that I wasn't really aware of when I started doing this research. Uh, but it does have these light ends and they can get lost quite easily. And then once you lose the lighter hydrocarbons that are making it um, less viscous for pipeline transport becomes quite, uh, quite viscous. Uh, so I can't, 
there we go. Um, and in terms of chemical properties, it has the different physical properties because it has a different chemistry. So a conventional crude um, is higher in saturates, uh, whereas diluted bitumen is heavier and is, has more asphaltines. Uh, and then in terms of pipelines, uh, you know, I think in Alberta, especially, you're, we're quite aware of pipelines and their presence. Uh, so this is a map of pipelines um, in major Canadian and US pipelines. Um, so there's quite a few leaving Alberta and then these are the kind of different pipelines around the province. And then, uh, so if Trans Mountain and then the Trans Mountain Expansion Project has pretty much the exact same route. Um, and then uh, Keystone and other pipelines. So how might uh, a pipeline impact groundwater? Uh, so this is kind of a schematic cross section of a pipeline. So along a lot of its route, it's gonna be above the water table. Um, and then maybe when it crosses underneath the river or in other scenarios, it, the pipeline can be below the water table. So how that's gonna, if you have a spill from here, it's gonna leach down to get to the groundwater. Um, and then if you have a spill where it's below the water table, it can leach up. Um, and so this, uh, you know, potential for groundwater impacts is just one of the concerns that uh, people have related to pipeline transport. Uh, you know, for spills of the surface water, uh, impacts on aquatic ecosystems, as well as um, greenhouse gas emissions of what well, the downstream end of it, of that oil getting uh, used in combustion. So the objectives of this work are to compare, uh, you know, how is a spill of the litter bitumen different than a spill of conventional crude if it's spilled in contaminates groundwater? The focus of the design and the experiment that I'm gonna talk about, I'm sorry, it keeps jumping ahead on me, um, is on, um, a simulated pipeline spill. And we're focusing on the dissolved phase. So what gets from the oil into the water? So uh, you know, I'm gonna jump ahead and show you a picture of the tank and then I'll go back. So this is what one of these uh, experiments looks like. So this is a, um, a fish tank that has been converted to conduct these experiments. So we have these extra partitions put in this fish tank. It's filled with sand. Uh, I can even jump ahead one more. So we have an injection port, a water injection port here, and then a water discharge port at the kind of downstream end. So we pump in water by a, per, a peristaltic pump, comes in here, moves down gradient and discharges from the other end. And then we have a separate port uh, our oil injector. So this is a tube that goes in and uh, that tube has holes in it along its length. So then we can inject oil into the top using a syringe. So that tank is uh, filled with sand. So it's mostly quartz sand uh, with albite and arthrite and calcite. Our flow rate's about five milliliters a minute. Uh, and so we've been conducting two different kind of two experiments. Well, they're part of the same one, but we have to do it separately because we only have three tanks. So the first uh, was diluted bitumen, and then the second was conventional crude. So I'm going to kind of show those two different um, sets of results compared against each other. So we'll just jump back ahead here. So in each uh, experiment, we're injecting. Oh, here, I'm just gonna add, admit people to the waiting, that are in the waiting room. Hopefully that's okay. Um, so we're injecting about 900 milliliters of crude oil by that oil injection port. And then uh, we collect water samples at the downstream end, uh, initially sampling daily, and then twice a week as we get, kind of, we try to capture that first kind of breakthrough of the plume and the concentrations increasing. And then um, 
sampling less frequently as 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 progresses the experiment progresses because things are changing less. And we're collecting samples for BTEX, so benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylenes, uh, as well as polycyclic aromatic carbons. And that's so they're they're being collected to kind of you know looking at the hydrocarbon impact on the water. Then also looking at uh, kind of routine parameters. So hydraulic conduct or not hydraulic electrical conductivity, pH, oxidative, oxidative reduction potential, uh, dissolved oxygen, major ions, and trace metals. And then a little bit of isotopes as well, well, total organic carbon, and then isotopes of the total organic carbon, and then isotopes of benzene and toluene. Um, so in the kind of following slides, I'm gonna be showing some of these results. Uh, not everything is in this presentation. So uh, the first thing, kind of looking at the routine parameters, um, and I'm going to start on the right-hand side. So the pH is pretty similar between the two experiments. The discharge, so just this is the discharge that comes out of that tank. So the water comes in, interacts with the oil a bit, and then it discharges from the tank. So the pHs are pretty close. There's a slight difference. I'm not sure, I haven't really figured out exactly why yet, because um, they're pretty much the same. It's just a slight difference. The conductivity is different in the water. However, uh, we think this is the result. I'm sorry, I moved my hand too much and then it moved ahead on me. Um, I think this is the result of this uh, conventional tank. Uh, we ran the dilute bitumen experiment first and then the conventional crude tank next experiment second. Um, and after kind of the experience with the diluted bitumen, we realized, okay, when we set this up, we've got to flush more water through it. Um, when we when we ran the diluted bitumen, we thought the, it, the concentrations were stable, uh, but then they continued to, to decrease. So you live and learn. So, uh, but we don't see any big changes when we inject or anything like that. Uh, the oxidative reduction potential, oxidation reduction potential is pretty similar. And same with the dissolved oxygen. We see some similar trends through the experiment. I uh, know I didn't show all the major ions, uh, but they are quite similar to each other in both experiments. Um, most of the trace elements were below, uh, below the detection limit or just kind of gradually decreased. Um, kind of mirroring the um, major ions. We did see uh, this increase in manganese um, after the injection of oil. So we're we just ran some experiments trying to make sure this is likely um, manganese that's being released from the oil. Uh, but another possibility uh, that we're trying to assess if, if it was what's going on is if there's some kind of redox change in the redox conditions locally near the oil, um, causing a release of manganese from, uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the oil, or the sand near the oil. Now, in terms of the total dissolved organics, uh, once we start the experiment, we see an increase in the total dissolved organics, which is what we would expect. We're, you know, we start the experiment, there's no oil in the tank, and then we inject this oil. We expect there to be some organics coming out, getting into the water. So those organics increase quickly, and we do see higher concentrations uh, from the conventional tank than the diluted bitumen tank. There's some interesting trends here with the diluted bitumen. It increases, starts to decrease, and then it kind of increases again. I'm not sure why that is. Um, and then when I made these, this slide, we didn't have these results yet. Um, so uh, how this kind of continues here. Uh, and then with the isotopes, um, we see there's a slight difference between the trends in each of them. Uh, what isn't shown on here is the uh, isotopic concentration of the initial oil. Um, and I'm expecting I hadn't, um, I think we now have that result in. So that was done separately. It had to be, the oil had to be done a different method than the actual water. 
But in terms of kind of probably the most important results, uh, so the, the, the BTEX, and the reason I say the most important is this is the type, the, the benzene, the toluene, ethylbenzene, xylenes, these are kind of your, your key um, indicators of hydrocarbon contamination. And uh, when I first kind of made these slides, a colleague of mine was like, what are you working with benzene for? It's a carcinogen. And it's like, well, that's exactly why we're working with it. It, these are these are um, a, a big problem in terms of water quality if you have this in the water. So we see our concentrations increase uh, very quickly at the start of the experiment. Um, so for benzene, uh, they're fairly similar between the two tanks at the start um, as we progress through the experiment. So this is uh, the, the days since the start of the experiment. Uh, we get to see a higher concentration in the conventional crude experiment than in the diluted bitumen experiment. Uh, now with the ethyl benzene, toluene and xylenes, uh, we see a similar kind of quick increase at the start of the experiment, uh, but the concentrations are much are significantly higher in the conventional crude tank. Um, so quite a bit higher for ethyl benzene and xylenes, um, and then probably about double for uh, toluene. So uh, kind of in terms of kind of the preliminary conclusions um, is that we have um, the electrical conductivity and major ion concentrations through the experiment. Um, they kind of gradually decrease. And then uh, this is all presumably sourced from the sand. Uh, then in terms of trace metals, the one thing that we really noted was the manganese increasing after oil injection uh, from both the conventional crude and the diluted bitumen tank. Uh, sorry. Um, and then the concentrations of the dissolved organics in the uh, discharge water. Um, from the conventional um, crude experiment tended to be higher than that, those from the diluted bitumen. So kind of what's next? Um, there's some kind of remaining data processing and uh, kind of checking some of the results, uh, kind of meeting this afternoon, just kind of discussing with some of the, the technicians, some of the results, kind of checking some stuff. Um, and I was just actually just yesterday looking at the carbon 13 of the benzene and toluene to look at some of the differences. Um, so really what we're looking there is uh, that's isotopes on a specific compound. Um, so we're, that's that will be of interest is um, if one of them is getting degraded differently or released differently um, from the oil. And then so kind of kind of really working on really interpreting all that stuff, putting it all together. Um, and then the next experiments we're going to be doing is looking at a spill that occurs above the water table. So that is the first case study. Um, so I guess we'll keep going and we can kind of do questions for both um, case studies at the end. Um, if we're if we were in the audience uh, in the classroom like we normal, I would just. Uh, Stop for questions there, but I think it might be easier online to go to the end. So the second case study is noble gases and subsurface gas migration. So this is very uh, quite different uh, to the previous one. That was a purely a lab study, um, whereas this is a, a field study. And the reason for this is related to public concern related to subsurface gas migration. And this isn't in, uh, you know, I think uh, five or six years ago, it was really popular, the common topic came up a lot, um, especially in other parts of Canada, um, related to hydraulic fracturing and concern over gas migration caused as a, or potentially caused a, uh, by hydraulic fracturing. Um, and this is kind of the focus is on kind of methods to look at that gas migration and understand what, uh, how, it, what's, why it's, why it's happening. So um, 
the work is focused on gas migration at a CO2 injection research site um, and really focused on testing noble gases and kind of further developing that tool for understanding gas migration, whether it's occurring if it's natural or if it's anthropogenic. Um, and as I kind of mentioned already, there's this concern around leaky wells. Um, so gas migration associated with leaky wells. Um, and here's just an example of one of the papers. It's a few years old now. Uh, so the noble gases, if you're not a, um, uh, well, there's not a lot of people that really work on noble gases in groundwater. So just kind of a recap. So noble gases are on the far right-hand side of the periodic table. There, um, and, and this study, I'm not looking at all at radon, kind of right down here, but we've looked at helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon. And the reason that they're of interest is uh, they don't participate in the chemical or biological reactions. Um, we get, if, if they're there, they, um, they're either, well, we'll talk about that next slide. <laughs> So you have kind of these three sources, the atmosphere, uh, the crust, and then a magmatic component. So in somewhere like the Western Canada Sedimentary Basin, we really only have this crustal component or this atmospheric component and this crustal component. Uh, the magmatic component really comes play into play if you have somewhere where there's more, there's more volcanism, say like a uh, mid-Atlantic mid Ridge or somewhere like that. So, um, which try to slow down kind of because this is kind of kind of has this oh R over RA what does that mean so R over RA is the helium three four in your sample compared to air so we just I just talked about your different components so your atmospheric ratio here so this is the helium three four ratio in air so air over air gives you one. Um, and then the neon over the helium in air so puts you over here around 4.4. .4. Uh, then you have crustal ingrowth, so stuff coming from the crust. And you get a lot of helium-4 from the crust. It's mostly helium-4. You get a little bit of helium-3. Um, so in the kind of crustal areas. And then if you had that magnetic source, you get uh, helium-3 associated with that. But for the Western Canada sedimentary basin, you kind of expect your waters to kind of lie in this area. Um, and then if you have a shallow water that has modern precipitation, you will ex expect to get some uh, impact from tritium. So these are gases in the Western Canada sedimentary basin. Uh, so you have kind of everything kind of plots down here. So these, uh, so air equivalent water, and these are gas wells. So just to kind of give you that context, if this is what we expect, I said, oh, this is what we expect, and this is what we get. And that's in a, a previous study from 1992. Uh, one of the other aspects of the interest in noble gases is um, this, uh, one of my co-authors uh, is uh, Tom Dara at Ohio State University. So um, he published his paper about six years ago. Yeah, 2014. Um, and they looked at a whole bunch of groundwater samples in the Marcellus Basin and uh, the Barnett Shale, looking for evidence of gas migration. I just kind of give you a, a kind of sense of what they're looking for. Uh, the black line here and the green, uh, the black and the light blue line, are where you expect your most groundwaters to sit and a little off that. Um, so that's a, you know, an air equilibrated water would be that blue line. So uh, if, you, if you have a water bottle on your table or a glass of water, that would be, that would sit close to that. Um, excess air is we get these bubbles pushed in and that happens in our groundwater. Uh, it's believed to be the result of kind of changes in your water table. So bubbles get pushed in, and then there's when there's greater pressure on the water, it gets dissolved in the water. So that kind of changes your composition of your water a little bit. Uh, but in their study, they found these samples uh, with these different ratios. 
and they are attributed to kind of stripping. So we're losing gas from the water. Um, and then this, these other ones that are redissolution of migrated bubbles. So a gas separates off and then it redissolves somewhere else. So what we're trying to look for is interesting trends in, in different stuff at this site we're working at. So this is the field research station. Uh, it's located near Brooks. It's ran by uh, CMC Research Institutes, which is associated uh, with the University of Calgary. So uh, they have this um, CO2, like this is the CO2 injection well, there's a big tank of CO2 here. Um, behind over here, kind of behind there's a the little shack here and then behind that is a geochemistry monitoring well. Behind, right, kind of right behind me is a geophysics monitoring well. And all across this site, um, you can see it's covered in snow, but you know, there's little stakes and uh, some tubes coming up all over the place. There's geophones um, and some really interesting geophysical equipment. Um, and then there's some also some uh, other researchers have been testing kind of different air monitoring equipment. Just check the time here, so we're good. Uh, and then there's a bunch of different groundwater wells that are shallower. So there's a, our injection well here is 300 meters deep. This geophysics monitoring well is about, uh, is also 300, this geochemistry monitoring well is 300 meters deep. So really they're kind of for monitoring this plume. And then we have these other groundwater wells that are really kind of to simulate the types of wells that, you know, this well is a domestic water well. It's, it's designed to simulate the type of well that a landowner might have. And then we have these other two different multi-level systems, a West Bay, uh, which is a very sophisticated multi-level. And then this other uh, multi-level well that has fewer depths, uh, but is a, has this, just a different sampling design. Um, so really trying to get, see what you can, what type of information you can get with these different types of uh, um, installations. So, oh, and then the other thing I wanted to talk about inside, the, the deep wells have a surface casing vent and the goal of this surface casing vent is um, the surface casing is completed to uh, the depth or below the depth of groundwater protection. And the idea of that is if the well leaks, it diverts gas past groundwater and vents it to the atmosphere. So the idea is to protect, it's helping protect groundwater. Uh, an unintended cause of that is you are releasing greenhouse gas emissions. So they're standard in Alberta. Um, different jurisdictions have different uh, kind of regulations surrounding surface casing vents. And just, I wanted to, I thought it'd be good to just few few different field pictures. I was, you know, if, if uh, you're not interested in this research at all, at least maybe some nice pictures is at least fun. <laughs> uh, so Brooks is in, uh, the field site's just near Brooks. It gets often quite windy down there. So this was a, a winter's day when at the end, towards the end of the day, it really got really, really windy. Uh, so snow was just blowing everywhere. And we, well, I'll get to that next, the truck's getting stuck. Um, and then this uh, summer student I had a few years and then myself doing some uh, water level measurements and some sampling. Uh, and then this is this uh, field uh, uh, mass spectrometer. I'll talk about it in a few slides. And then, um, you know, with uh, field work always comes unexpected things uh, like your truck or somebody else's truck getting stuck and having to dig them out. And then uh, the alternative to that is, well, just pull your gear on a sled, um, which Sounds like a lot of work, but it's uh, preferable than wasting your time shoveling out a, a Ram 3500 because they're, well, it's a big truck. <laughs> so uh, sampling noble gases, it's not like sampling uh, for, you know, dissolved ions. They're gases and they can quickly escape your water. Um, in addition to that, helium is a, is very small, so it's it's hard to trap it. So the standard wave sampling is uh, using these copper tubes. 
So uh, you flow the sample, the water through the copper tube, and then there's these specialized clamps that you use to seal these up. And then you have to send this sample off to a lab. So these have all been analyzed at Ohio State. Uh, there's only, I think there's two labs in Canada that can do the work, a handful of labs in the States. So it's not a, it's not a routine analysis. This other method is uh, using this uh, field mass spectrometer. Uh, so this is a, a little quadrupole mass spec, and there's a couple of pumps in here, and we just have the surface casing vent, and then air flows through here, uh, and then into the mass spec, and then we measure it on the, the computer. Uh, so its advantages are you're doing it in the field. You can do quick targeted sampling, quick results. Um, now, the way I have the instrument set up right now, these are the gases we can run, working on setting it up for methane and CO2. Uh, but you also can't do all the isotopes. So really your uh, kind of your, your premium method is uh, using a copper tube sample and sending it off to a big a lab that has a really good noble gas uh, magnetic sector spectrometer. Uh, but this kind of is a great field tool that really, really helps. Um, and we've just been working on a paper kind of comparing the two different, the results from each. So the surface casing vents. So these are just gases that are migrating up these vents and uh, flowing out from the vents. So we have uh, three or four different vents here. So atmospheric air has very low methane and very low helium compared to these vents. Um, your geophysics physics well and the injection well have similar concentrations, slightly higher helium in the uh, uh, geophysics well, so presumably a slightly different source. Um, and then same for the, uh, um, the, geo the geochemistry well and the geochem well interior, uh, slightly different. But these are, I should just add that these have a lot of uh, atmospheric air mixed in them. There's, you know, you have a vent, it's producing gas at a slower rate. Uh, so there ends up to be some mixing. So, and I don't know if I can hide this top. Sorry. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see that bar at the top or not, but this is groundwater, uh, CH4 versus depth. Um, in the upper 100 meters, CO4 uh, methane concentrations increase uh, with decreasing depth. So the shallow samples tend to have higher methane, which was an interesting result. Um, you know, I kind of expected it to be the other way around, uh, that we would have lost, you know, methane migrates up, the shallow waters are younger, and you've lost methane out of the system. Um, the, these, some of these shallow zones are in coals. So basically, they're likely getting their coal, their, their methane kind of very, very locally, or at least a significant chunk of that little methane. Um, now, so here's nitrogen, so not a noble gas compared with argon. Um, and like I talked about earlier, this is kind of the range we expect, expect samples to fall in over here, the black line, blue line, or in this little area here, but we see lower concentrations. And this is attributed to be stripping. So basically, uh, potentially bubbles are forming, removing some of the gas from the system. So you have that uh, uh, methane, you know, lots of methane, bubbles forming, stripping some gas out and migrating it out of the system, changing the concentrations. We see the same thing when we look at the xenon versus the uh, neon. Um, you would generally expect a water in this area, you know, to have a concentration right around where my uh, where my uh, my pointer is right here. Uh, but we see these concentrations quite a bit lower. And just to kind of you know, air equilibrated water would fall along this line here, and that concentrate that where it falls along that line changes with temperature. So this would be the top line would be zero Celsius. And this would be a water at 20 Celsius. And this is adding that extra air, the excess air that I mentioned earlier. So we see 
we have quite a bit lower concentrations um, and that's attributed to this stripping. One of the implications of this, uh, it just changes the calculations and the interpretation you can do with this, the result. So um, as I kind of presented earlier on, this RC over, uh, so the helium-3 ratio, helium-3 fur ratio um, of the sample over that of air. So our samples, uh, so there's air, air, or air, air equilibrated water. All our samples fall down here, um, whether they're a water or a uh, gas sample. So they're all similar range. So there's, you know, which is what we expect there to be some degree interconnection. They're getting their, their helium from the same place. Um, and as I mentioned, helium is very mobile. So it's, you know, it's gonna migrate between the systems. So uh, to try to kind of relate that gas system and that groundwater system, um, we can't use the same concentrations because they're, you know, one is getting lost from the other. So our shallow groundwater samples, if we divide the methane over the helium concentration, has this higher ratio, the shallower or the deeper groundwaters tend to have that kind of ratio. And then we have the surface casing vent samples. Uh, now these are estimated depth. We don't, um, the, the, so my colleagues at the University of Calgary, they're estimating the depth that the surface, the gases and surface casings are coming from based on the uh, carbon isotopes. Um, and the methane over helium ratios kind of are consistent with what we expect for groundwater at that depth. If it, you know, if it was coming shallower, you expect to get a lot more uh, methane compared to that helium. And this is uh, the blues are from the injection zone. So the, uh, this is groundwater, uh, groundwater and gas samples in the isotopes of uh, the hydrogen isotopes and the methane isotopes for CH4. So there's a, the groundwater is a slightly depleted compared to the surface casing vents. They are from a different depth. Um, so we're expecting a different source. These shallow groundwaters are ex interpreted to be highly kind of secondary biogenic methane produced from those coals. Uh, whereas the potential for a bit more, a uh, bit of a deeper source maybe from these uh, surface casing vents, but they're also very biogenic signature. So, um, there's a lot of really complicated stuff going on in this data. Um, if you're like, what the heck is this story? <laughs> uh, well, I'm still working on figuring out exactly what the story is. Uh, but we do see this difference uh, in these shallow samples of higher methane in the shallower wells. Uh, the delta 13 ratio is just biogenic gas, sec secondary methane from the coals. Uh, and then we see this gas stripping, uh, which tells us a lot about what's going on in the system. Um, one of the things that we often use noble gases for is determining the recharge temperature. Uh, and we had an interest in doing this at this site uh, because it would help us tell us, did water recharge? Is this water originally from recharge during the last ice age or um, under different climatic conditions? But uh, with the amount of this gas stripping that's occurred, we can't really do any of those calculations. It's, it's all, uh, the signal's too messed up to be able to tell anything. So uh, yeah, so, and, I, and just as I finished on that slide there, uh, this is kind of work that's ongoing and kind of we're trying to understand stuff. Uh, linking back to the kind of the objective of understanding gas migration, a lot of these samples have been taken prior to injection or at the very start of injection. So what we're gonna be looking for over time is, is are there changes in these samples as, uh, as we get further along with injection? And one of the things, um, we're really getting close to where they started injection about two years ago now. Um, and that plume of CO2, uh, and I'm just gonna run back here. 
So uh, they're injecting in the injection well. And uh, you know, this is just a schematic diagram. The plume has pretty much reached the geophysics well, uh, but it hasn't, we're expecting it to reach the geochemistry well. Oh, wow. Pretty much any any time in the next, you know, kind of any time now. Um, so we're going to be looking for do our results, you know, um, we're able to sample from inside this geochemistry well and the outside. Um, do we see changes? Do we see something in that surface casing event? We we hope hope not, um, but there's always a chance that there's something that we see there. Uh, so we'll we'll see. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, I think there's there's time for questions here. So let's just, uh, yeah. Uh, so right, thank you so much, Dr. Artin, for your informative presentation, and thank you for sharing your research on groundwater chemistry related really, to oil sands and. Um, so to storage. Um, my name is Len. I'm supposed to take over the Q and A session. Okay. <laughs> and um, now we do have a, a bunch of questions in the chat. I will bring them up one by one. So the first one is from Diana. Uh, she asked, "What is the extent of difference between simulated lab conditions results and what actually happens in the field?" Is probably to your first case study. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a really good question. Because um, linking those two is very, you know, it's going to depend. Yeah, it's quite. Um, you know, the goal of that is really to see, okay, what is it theoretically going to do? Uh, linking that to a field real site is um, kind of a challenge. Uh, I think you're gonna you're gonna see similar processes, um, but what's really different for a lab study is it's 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 much shorter duration. You know, we're doing that over uh, kind of two months or so, uh, whereas um, a real field study, it's a, you know a spill in the field. Um, you know, if it's a big pipeline breach that suddenly occurs, uh, they're gonna know about it. I think the, the bigger concern is, is a spill that happens slowly. There's a slight leak from a pipeline um, and something happens over a longer period. So under that scenario, what is the real big difference is going to be is more potential for uh, biological, like microbial degradation of contaminants in the water. Um, and so that's, you know, that's part of the aspect of the process is that we're we're probably not getting much of in the lab study. Um, so really, I think as we as I progress, that's something we'd like to look into more. If, if there was potential to get a, a, a real field site, that would be fantastic. Uh, but that's kind of a, a matter of finding a site where a spill has occurred and it's instrumented, so. Thank you for the answer. And the next one is from Gabriela. Based on the laboratory results of a diluted bitumen, do you think there is an increased or decreased possibility of absorption of hydrocarbons during migration in aquifers? Um, well, I mean, you have the diluted bitumen has appears to have, you know, lower BTEX concentrations being uh, released from the water or from the oil. Uh, but there's a lot of other things going on with diluted bitumen. Um, and I know other people have worked on it. And I mean, we, we see this in our study as well, is that you start to lose, um, I think what happens with the little pitch is you start to lose the light ends and you start almost creating a, a film around the oil. So that has the potential to reduce the amount of stuff that releases out. In terms of kind of absorption onto aquifer material, I, it really just depends on the aquifer and what's in that aquifer. Um, yeah, so uh, kind of what the initial oil is going to affect, kind of how much can come out, and then um, that aquifer is going to affect how quickly it migrates. Okay, and the third one is from Noga. Uh, the question is about the first case study. 
she's wondering hydrocarbons from different sources will have different compositions. Um, so the difference in the results are understandable. Um, why you selected um, those um, sources to compare between the two hydrocarbons and what are the implications of this test to the real world? So the idea um, is, so there's been a lot of, quite a lot of groundwater research related to spills of conventional crude. Um, now, not, you know, not all conventional crudes are the same and not all diluted bitumens are the same. They're, you know, the, the chemistry of those does change, but it does kind of fit in these different kind of ranges. Uh, so kind of the goal was, is really, okay, well, we know a lot about what's going to happen with a conventional spill. Um, there's not been a lot, there has been research on diluted bitumen spills, but there hasn't been as much. So really trying to understand, okay, well, what are the differences going to be? Um, you know, basically how's that spill going to be different? Um, so that we can kind of have a better idea. Well, really if, if there's different, if there's implications for how it needs to be, be treated, um, in a real world spill. Thank you. And uh, we have last one from Alenka. The question is, do you have um, isotopic signatures for the shallow coast? Did you collect isotopic data for, I uh, try to pronounce it, der, delta D, um, stage four? Um, oh, for the coals? Now, yeah, for the shallow uh, coast. Uh, I, so I don't, but people I work with, do. Um, so my kind of work at that site's been really focused on the, the noble gases. Uh, but I know uh, Bernard Meyer's group at the University of Calgary has done a lot of the uh, reactive gases as well. Um, when I started sampling at the site, I just, I wasn't collecting any of the isotope samples. Uh, but then I was like, oh, no, this is really important. We've got to link these two together. Um, so that's a, that's a good point. Uh, something I have to look up because I know they've measured um, the isotopic ratios in those coals um, of the coal and uh, the gas that's quickly released. So that's a good good point. All right, thank you so much for answering those questions. And with that, I think this concludes the seminar and uh, I'd like to turn this to Kevin, if he has anything to bring up at the end. Uh, no, nothing to bring up, just wanna thank uh... Dr. Udin, one more time for the great presentation and uh, being willing to come out and uh, chat with all of us today. Thank you.